Okay, I think we can start the afternoon session. And the first speaker is Rieb Basag, who will speak about UV behavior of N equals 4 supergravity with the subtitle uh, now there. Thank you. Okay, let, let me first thank the, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk here. It's better to be back in Pisa. So, let me first discuss uh, a little bit how the, the, the motivation uh, goes ar around those things. So, as you already heard uh, this morning from uh, Renata, there is quite many questions about uh, inequality supergravity and beyond the fact that it would be finite or not, we are interested in knowing if it could be a consistent quantum field theory by itself. So, the, the, the main question beyond uh, finiteness is, uh, is it free of ambiguity as stated to the log divergence? So, of course, if it was finite, this would be the case, but this, is, uh, this could be more complicated than this. So, so far, it seems that we have explanation for the very good behavior that they find using explicit computation, and we may wonder if this is going to be it, or if there is actually some hidden symmetry in the series that would explain for that. So this is, of course, a most optimistic point of view that Vibran uh, would like to have. So let me review quickly how uh, uh, it goes. So. When you compute uh, one loop amplitude in uh, supergravity, uh, with a very naive power counting, you, you, you should find that the, the integral diverges if you take this naive power counting k, k to the 8 over k to the 8. So, so it looks like it's quartic, uh, qu quartically divergent. But in fact, what happens is that you have eight external momenta which factorize. And when you then consider the integral, you get a, a perfectly finite integral. And you can understand that because the, the, the one loop invariant which appears in the effective action in fact corresponds to a term which uh, involves a byte tensor to the fourth which represents those eight derivatives. Once you go to two loop, the same processes appear, but now you extract even 12 external momenta, which is related to the fact that then this invariant would correspond to this d4 or to the fourth invariant. And the same processes goes down. So for, for loop, where it appears that the structure is the one that could correspond to seven loop divergence. So, how can we understand those functions? One thing, we, uh, those invariant. What one can show is that all of those three invariant, for instance, are not duality invariant. And so, corresponding to the symmetry of the series that we could show, they cannot appear as three loop, five loop, six loop divergence. But to understand why they already appear at those loop order, it's interesting to go to higher dimension. So if you consider the same invariant in higher dimension, you get that the one loop divergence which appear in supergravity in A dimension precisely corresponds to the R to the fourth. So you get naturally the R to the fourth associated to the one loop. The same thing appears at two loops, where at two loops you get uh, a logarithmic divergence in seven dimension, which fits perfectly with this P12 factorization. Again, at three loop, you get the same in six dimension. And the question is, is the seven loop corresponding to, uh, to a logarithmic divergence in uh, inequality per gravity in four dimension or not? This is the power counting that would fit in that case. So, since it's hard to go straight to those questions, we have been studying, uh, and especially Zwiebern and, uh, and uh, Davis, Den and, and uh, Wong, have been studying the case of half maximal supergravity. So, in those cases, one loop is also protected from exactly the same point of view, that is, you, you get an R to the fourth, but naively, if you think of duality symmetry, the same counter term could, in principle, appear at two loop and three loop, and then correspond to a two loop divergence in five dimension and a tr three loop divergence in four dimension. However, their explicit computation gives that those terms are actually finite, so one has to understand those properties. I also mentioned that they, they did the, the, the case without any vector multiplet, whereas Vanov and Turkin using a string theory uh, effective action uh, gets a similar result in the presence of vector multiplet. So, in order to try to explain this, uh, I will start to review the problem of the SL2 rigid symmetry which appears in n equals 4, which was not there for the maximal case, which in principle would naively allow you to have invariants which are not even duality invariant, which would then lead you to have infinitely many possible counter terms. Then uh, I'll discuss uh, the possible R to the invariant that one can have uh, at, uh, at the three-loop order and see how one can then understand how the, anom uh, the anomaly can or not uh, modify the structure of the divergences. 
I discuss quickly, uh, uh, but without giving the detail, what happened in five dimension and what happened in the presence of vector multiplets. And then uh, I try to explain how uh, we could understand the absence of divergence in those cases, uh, referring to uh, harmonic superspace method and algebraic method. So this is mainly based on the paper which uh, the, did not appear yet, and I just mentioned those two other papers because uh, I mean those results were important for what I'm going to say. So for, for those who are not aware of this theory uh, in detail, I will just quickly review the, the field content of a uh, pure and equal force per gravity in four dimensions. So you get one scalar field, uh, complex scalar field, which parameterize the SL2 by, by SL2 corset, or SU11 by U1, as you wish. You, you get four uh, vial fermions, probably eating two times four uh, degrees of freedom. You get six uh, electromagnetic fields, which fit all together in two times six electromagnetic fields. That's the first order equation. You get the, the four gravity no super field, and of course, the two degrees of freedom associated to the metric. So what happens is that from all those degrees of freedom, the, fer the fermions and the vector field are special because they transform non-trivially with respect to the U1 Carl symmetry. And using uh, the family uh, index uh, theorem of at uh, Atia and Singer, Marcus computed that in, in this theory you, you get in fact an anomaly. So the U1 is broken at one loop. And in fact, it leads to a rigid anomaly for the SL2 symmetry. So if you compute the, the, the consistent anomaly for the rigid symmetry, you get that the, the, its explicit form appears when you, uh, you act with a non-linearly realized generator on the effective action. And you should get something which uh, has one power of the dilaton, exactly the one which corresponds to the imaginary part of the variable parameterizing the comp uh, complex upper house plane. And the factor you get for n vector multiplet is precisely 2 plus n. So in order to understand this at the level of the amplitude, you should consider the off-shell amplitude, and you get that the first contribution of this anomaly is this three-point function, which gets then this, uh, this factor. So uh, as Ben Attap mentioned, and we discussed that quite lengthy yesterday, this amplitude vanishes uh, when you take uh, on-shell momentum because of the three-point behavior of supersymmetric amplitude. But uh, Dixon and Beb, when we just last week could actually compute the same amplitude but for complex momenta and get the result which fits perfectly with this uh, contribution in their formalism. So this is interesting because in principle you could modify the anomaly by adding trivial terms. But we see that you, you can always modify the anomaly such that you would not only break the F generator but also the parabolic subgroup which is the rescaling of the, the, the complex star fill and the shift of the action. But we see with these computations that they are in the same convention, that is, they fix the anomaly in the same way, so they also preserve the parabolic sub, which is going to be important in the following. So the, the parabolic subgroup is preserved at this on the rigid level. But in fact, you have to consider that to be consistent with supersymmetry, you should not only consider the exponential minus 2 phi times the Pontry eigen class, but you should also uh, get the supersymmetric invariant. And if you construct the supersymmetric invariant, as I will discuss in a second, you get also an axionic coupling to post bonnet So when you use the best domino consistent condition, you get that the anomaly for the A generator does not give you completely, okay, something completely trivial. It's ghost bonnet so it vanishes modulo the, uh, it's a total derivative. But if you were considering the current, uh, the conservation of the current, you would get a right hand side. So the, the, the current world identity for uh, the, the lead datation generator is actually broken. So how to construct this invariant? The problem is that at the linearized level, you can define it as a Carl superspace integral over half of the Fermi coordinate. But if you look at the non-linear level, you, you get an obstruction for the existence of such integral. So you must consider other possibilities. In fact, the construction uh, is available and has been constructed by Gates and then further studied by uh, others, including Paul, actually, who worked with us on this collaboration. And the right way to think of it is to define closed superform. So if you have a full superform, which is closed in the full superspace, you will get that its pullback to the bosonic uh, subspace can be integrated over space and being supersymmetric. Basically, when you act with the derivative on the fermionic coordinate, by definition of declosure in superspace, you get that this part is an exterior derivative in ordinary space. So it's an invariant under supersymmetry. And to compute such a superform, what you do is that you decompose them with respect to the superfield bind 
to get an expression in terms of the tangent uh, coordinate. And those you can actually split with respect to the R symmetry group in terms of fermionic and bosonic co uh, components. Of course, you get the problem that now it's not just a linear R operator, which was just the exterior derivative in superspace, but you get the covariant derivative acting and uh, the torsion term which appear when you act on the superficial bind. But still, now you can focus on the lowest dimensional component of this superform. Basically, there is a cohomology that you can compute which tells you that as long as you can show that the lowest component satisfies the algebra, you know that there is no obstruction to go back to the fourth invariant. And this is what we did. So if you consider the equation for the lowest component, they appear to be those one. And you find a solution for any uh, anti-holomorphic, in that case, function of the scalar field. So for this, we decompose the SU11 component into the, the, the scalar field parameterizing the unit disk, which is itself a U1 invariant, and the U, uh, U1 uh, compensating factor superfield. So considering this, you get that the most important term is actually quadratic in the, in the field strength of the gate field, the, the corresponding superfield, and depend on an arbitrary function. And you get no obstruction for any such a function. So you can make different choice. The trivial choice is just to use the, the trivial function. And then you get consistently that it's all co-cycle just correspond to, uh, to the complex combination of uh, Gauss-Bonnet and Pontry Hagen which is what you, uh, you expect and you know, that is the only U1 invariant, uh, supersymmetric invariant, is a total derivative in n equals four. But now that you know this component, you can simply expand what it will be if you take the upper complex house plan coordinate. Then you know that the, the top component will have exactly the same value in front of the pantry again and in front of the ghost bonnet term, so that you get exactly what you need for the anomaly. So let's see how this thing uh, is going to get randomized. We know that the anomaly is just a local op operator at one loop order, but when you go further in perturbation theory, what you should actually consider is not the anomaly as a local, uh, as a local term, but as a local insertion inside the one PI generating functional. That is, you consider all the amplitude with the insertion of this local operator as a, right, and as a form factor, if you wish. And if I consider naively the regularized theory, where I would have this symmetry applying to, uh, to uh, the, the regularized uh, one PI functional not yet normalized and this uh, insertion, I see directly from the symmetry that the pole in epsilon associated to a, to a loop divergence will be directly related to the pole uh, associated to the renormalization of this anomaly as a local operator. So one deduce from that that if the anomaly is still pre preserved the parabolic subgroup, then any breaking of the nonlinearly realized generator on uh, a given invariant will be associated to one loop diver uh, a two loop a loop divergence in the, uh, in the anomaly as a local insertion. So if you were add a three loop divergence in the theory, it would be associated to a two loop divergence of this local operator. This is formal and would assume that you have a prescription for a normalization which satisfy all symmetry, but one can make this argument uh, precise and scheme independent by considering the corresponding kalen Simonsic equation and define beta three, not as just a, a pole in the regular uh, rise bear action, but as a, a term which appears in the kalen Simonsic equation, and then taking the consistency of the kalen Simonsic equation with the broken world identity associated to the anomaly, you get exactly the same result, but now associated to insertion of local operators. So in that case, because there is absolutely no invariant at two loop in the, in the theory, we deduce that at three loop, any candidate invariant must be invariant under the, the rescaling of the symmetry, invariant under the shift of the action, and if ever it transforms with respect to the non-linearly realized generator, this must be associated to a one loop divergence of the anomaly as a local insertion. So in order to study what are the possible uh, terms uh, we could possibly have, we have to study what are the possible invariants of this dimension. So in principle, at this order, you can integrate over full superspace any function of the complex scalar field. So k here is an arbitrary function of uh, the, the scalar field parameterizing the, the unit disk, and bar of e is just the Pisinian of the superfield band, which is uh, required for supercovariance. 
However, it's usually hard to know from such expression if it's going to vanish or not, or what uh, are its uh, properties. So in order to understand it, it will be useful to expand in normal coordinates to define what is the quartic factor which is really going to contribute to the, to the invariant. So to do that, we have to find vector field in superspace which are in involution considering the equation of motion. And there is not that many possibilities. One possibility, but which require to consider harmonic variables, is to consider a decomposition of the U whole U4 group to U1 times U2 times U1, so that you can pick the junction stated to 1 and 4 and define the corresponding vector. So those are basically the inverse field bind as stated to those directions, and you just pick one among the four coordinates in SU4 and the four for the corresponding uh, anti chiral derivative. But because of the curvature term, also this is consistent with the torsion, you know that you are going to generate also components in the harmonic sector. So you must consider a normal coordinate expansion with respect to both fermionic variables and uh, harmonic variables. This is kind of problematic if you think about it because this decomposition is in fact complex. It's really a normomorphic de decomposition. So if you look to the harmonic variable as defined by a coset space, you see that the corresponding decomposition corresponds to decomposition with respect to U1. So in fact, the grade minus one generator that you want to disregard are in fact the complex conjugate of the coordinate you want to expand on. And if we know that expanding along uh, holomorphic expansion in Grassmann variable makes absolute sense because you, the integral over Grassmann variable is in fact algebraic. So there is no problem in defining the notion of an integral over holomorphic component only. This is quite problematic if you want to do it over bosonic type variable. However, if you look to the expansion of the function I, I wanted to describe, which is a Berezinian of E times uh, the function of the scalar times the corresponding measure on the harmonic variable, you get that only the harmonic R measure is going to expand in terms of the harmonic complex coordinate. And the Berezinian of E times the function expansion only depend on the fermionic coordinate. So in fact, there you have a factorization. And you can forget completely about the expansion in the harmonic coordinate and just consider the R measure as it is. And consider the expansion of Berezinian of E times K in the fermionic variable only. So this is what uh, we have been doing first uh, with uh, Pierre Van Hoff, Paul Arl, and, uh, and Kelly. And doing it, we were finding that the, the, the naive integral of the trivial function 1 was giving 0. But in fact, you can also consider a generic function. And if you do that, you see that the expression you obtain is precisely the integral for the duality invariant r to the fourth, which is quartic in the Dirac Fermion in that case. But the, the scalar function gets acted on by the Laplace operator on the coset space minus 2 times Laplace operator. So trivially, you see that the, if the function is constant, you get zero because of the Laplace, uh, of the Laplace operator. And in fact, for any uh, solution of the Laplace equation of the, or the Poisson equation with eigenvalue 2, you would get zero. But still, you can define 1 as being the solution of the Laplace equation acting on the color potential by definition somehow. And so in this way, you see that the duality invariant is in fact the full superspace integral also, no, also it's not completely apparent. And it's the full superspace integral of the carrier potential, just like in uh, n equal 1. I mean, similarly to n equal 1. However, using that, we know that all the invariants are defined by a unique function of the scalar field. So they do not depend through the, the, the different derivative of the scalar field independently because of supersymmetry. And now if you require the invariance with respect to the parabolic subgroup, which I recall was just the the shift of the action and the, the rescaling of the complex scalar field, you get that this symmetry is actually enough to require that the function is a constant and in fact invariant with respect to all duality symmetry. In that case, just because the parabolic subgroup uh, acts positively uh, on the scalar field space. So only when you actually include those as their derivative, you can get contrial functions which are going to be invariant with respect to the parabolic but not with respect to the full group. So, using this observation, we, are, we can uh, already conclude the only possible invariant 
a tree loop is the one which corresponds to the integral over full superspace of the pair of potential, which uh, in those coordinates is just the logarithm of 1 minus tt bar. And this one leads to an invariant that can be computed at least at quartic order to give just the standard c square c bar square out to the fourth term. So before to try to give an explanation for why this invariant could actually be forbidden, let me discuss how those things actually generalize when you consider vector multiplets. So as many of you uh, might know, once you consider vector multiplets, the theory turns out to diverge already at one loop. And this is associated to an F to the fourth type counter term, which is in fact duality invariant and supersymmetric. So it was actually quite a work to, to show that it was duality invariant, which was absolutely necessary for the consistency. But but after, because you, you can write it as a, a superspace integral over half of the coordinate, which are also of uh, harmonic nature, but then it's not manifestly duality invariant. But still, you don't get contradiction yet. You have to show that the, the variation with respect to duality would, uh, would not vanish. And in fact, constructing it directly from a co cycle, you can see that the co cycle is uh, entirely duality invariant. So at one loop you get this invariant and the infinite tower of R2 type invariant I was already talking about, but those are never duality invariant, so we'll be able to disregard them in terms of divergence. At two loops you get a one quarter BPS type uh, integral, which means an integral over uh, 12 uh, thetas instead of 16, which define also a purely matter term, which could be a candidate for a two loop uh, uh, divergence. And you get something which can basically give you something quadratic in the matter field uh, and the Riemann tensor, but which is manifestly not duality invariant and can be forgotten about for divergence. At three loop order, you get two different duality invariants, infinite tower of non-duality invariant term, but two independent uh, duality invariants. One can be written as a full superspace of the integral of the Kara potential, and one other one can only be written as an integral over 12 thetas. So from what I said, I already we know from duality that the only possible term associated to divergence are the one loop one, the two loop one, which may be forbidden, but we have not been able to prove it directly, and the, the three loop ones. But now, if we make a stronger assumption, which would be the existence of a, an off-shell formulation for the theory, we would rule out directly two more of them. The one loop one is not forbidden by such a procedure because we, we, uh, we know in generic formulation in full superspace that the, the goals are going to contribute such that the one loop divergence is not forced to be writable as a full superspace integral of the gauge potential. But at higher order, it works. So it would rule out directly d to f to the fourth and as well as uh, the, the second r to the fourth type invariant. Quite interestingly, the, the, the situation is extremely similar, similar in five dimensions. So almost all that I said combined to five dimensions. In fact, it's even simpler because there, there is no uh, anomaly in that case. But I mean about the, the normal coordinate expansion, everything goes through in the same way. And in that case, you can uh, integrate an arbitrary function of the dilatum, which is the only superficial in pure supergravity in five dimensions. And you get exactly the same kind of behavior with the chi to the fourth term, which will directly contribute to the r to the fourth invariant, and some derivative acting on this function. So since you have one naked derivative, you see also that if the function is one, trivially, you get no invariant. But trivially also, if you get the function to just be linear in the dilatant, the derivative will give you this function, and the other factor will contribute, will, uh, yes? So, uh, I mean, uh, most theory and so at one loop, you could contain the theory with those zero symmetry manifest, and they would remain. But definitely, all n equal two theory with symmetric space are going to have anomaly of this kind. So all those groups are. are are prior destroyed just like it was for n equal 4. The thing in n equal 4 that helps a lot is that you have very few invariants to get modification of the anomaly order by order. In n equal 2, one would have to do the analysis, but since you have much more possibility for the invariant, there are good chances that uh, once you go to 3, you have already uh, destroyed completely the, the world identity. So the pre 
the, the anomaly only prefer uh, order by order, and for have a proliferation, you, you, you need to have an invariant. The more invariant you have, the more uh, the anomaly will be dangerous quickly. So we did not do the uh, the analysis for n equal to, but a priori already at three loops it will be uh, dramatically destroyed. So uh, yeah, in that case, you see again that you can define a full superspace integral, but again, you need to define a uh, duality invariant full superspace integral, but you need to define it as a superspace integral of a function which is not itself duality invariant, exactly as in four dimensions. So the situation is extremely similar. So before to claim the, that we may have uh, uh, an optional formation of the theory, le let me recall that there is at least one case where it has been worked out. So. Uh, uh, let me first mention sorry, the, the normalization theorem. So if you consider the no-go theorem, if you have finitely many auxiliaries, you can do precise counting about the possible theories that can admit of shell formulation with all supercharged real life linearly. And Rivel and Taylor di did it uh, in the case of n equal four supergravity, and their conclusion is that the only counting which fits with finitely many auxiliaries is the unique n equal four supergravity coupled to six vector multiplet. So precisely the ones that come from type one in 10 dimension. And indeed, Poirot, Nikolai, uh, and Van Poyen managed to show that, at least at the linearized level, that there exists an official formulation of type one supergravity in 10 dimension, which required to, to dualize the, the two form uh, B field to a six form. And this is written in terms of the current multiplet that you may know and the scalar multiplet. So, one problem with this formulation is that if you dimensionally reduce it down to four dimensions, you are not going to get a duality invariant formulation, but by definition, 15 of the scalar field will remain two forms, and the SO66 group will be broken to GL6. The same behavior appears in five dimension with uh, SO55 broken to GL5, and so you may wonder, because I, I, I want to be able to use both full superspace uh, Probert, uh, I mean, uh, off-shell formulation of uh, the whole 16 supercharge and the duality invariant. So in principle, this formulation is not enough to, to provide such a, such a tool even for uh, n equal uh, four coupled to six vector multiplet. However, we know already some cases where some specific series can be defined off shell, but not in all form. For example, if you take uh, a, n equal two rigid supersymmetry, and consider a tensor multiplet, you know you can realize a tensor multiplet uh, of shell. But if you want to, uh, to define the hyper multiplet, you, you can only do it using harmonic superspace. So considering the, the tensor multiplet ca can be equivalent to the hyper multiplet uh, for many series, for example, if you try to define n equal four at n equal two plus matter. But in general, you, you, you won't have all possible interaction. Whereas using the harmonic formulation, you can define basically any Lagrangian. So here we are proposing or supposing that this is what could happen for n equal four with n vector multiplet, and this formulation would actually exist independently of the number of vector multiplet and would moreover permit to satisfy duality invariance. So I'm going to make this strong assumption, which I assume is relatively strong, that there is an harmonic super speed formulation of n equal four coupled to n multiplet with the whole 16 supercharge realized linearly and for which, moreover, the action can be defined in a duality invariant form, which is equivalent to what uh, Eno and Teitelbaum, alias Bunster, have been doing um, for bosonic actions. So this is a strong uh, requirement. Not manifest, but still one well identity for the, the symmetry indeed, yeah. Yes. So the question is that even if I, uh, thank you, even if I admit all of that, can I actually show now my normalization theorem? Because uh, as I discussed, uh, there are actually candidates which are duality invariant, which are full superspace integral. So it's not obvious, even using the strong assumption, that it could deduce that the, the uh, divergence cannot be there. And the answer to that is that uh, this will require to consider uh, algebraic normalization method in harmonic superspace. So let me first start with a simple example, which is the n equal two, two nonlinear sigma model in two dimensions. 
So in that case, of course, you have an off-shell formulation of the theory. And you know that uh, for scalar field parametrizing uh, a color space, you can parametrize the action using the color potential. And also, you, you may expect that the color potential itself is a full-fledged function of the scalar field themselves, not pre-potential. And so it should be allowed as a contour term. But in fact, it's not what happened. So if you use our, um, if you use the background uh, field method, uh, as uh, Paul uh, Papadopoulos and uh, Kelly, who is here, uh, did, you can show that when you expand with respect to a now chosen uh, quantum uh, fluctuation uh, field, you get that all the Feynman rules that you are going to define are in fact defined in terms of covariant quantity in the scalar field. So you can use the invariance with respect to automorphic transformation of the carrier potential to deduce that the carrier potential is not a narrow contour term. In fact, only the covariant quantity in the background field will appear in perturbation theory. So if we were considering um, a symmetric color space, we could in fact require that the counter term have to be duality invariant. And how we could explain that, uh, I'm going to go into now. So, if you do perturbation theory, in general you can rotate any uh, beta function that would be associated to the row normalization in a higher order invariant in a strictly normal table theory to the anomalous dimension of the classical Lagrangian as a local operator to mix with higher order uh, local operator which defines the same counter term. And if you use the kalen Simenzik equation and you commute it with the derivative with respect to the coupling constant, you get that for a, a beta function associated to a n-loop divergence, n minus one times this uh, beta function is equal to the anomalous dimension of the corresponding operator. So if you can show that the anomalous dimension of the operator is zero at higher order in perturbation theory, then you get that the beta function must vanish as well as long as it's beyond one loop. So if we can consider the, the, the Lagrangian as a local operator, we have much more power because now we can require not only the invariance with respect uh, of the action, but the, invariant, the, the covariance of the Lagrange density itself. So if you have a Lagrange density which is not invariant with respect to a symmetry, which is however satisfied by the action, in an offshore formulation, you know by definition that the variation of this Lagrange density with respect to the symmetry must be a total derivative such that it vanishes, it's integrated. And in fact, in general, you may have a whole chain of uh, co-form like that, which are density with anti-symmetric, graded anti-symmetric indices in superspace. So if you consider now how to couple all of this to the theory, you can see that the transformation of the associated source will be such that they transform as uh, the exterior derivative of one of the others. That is, the source associated to the Lagrange density transform trivially. The source associated to the first correction transform as the exterior derivative of the first source, etc., etc., etc. The thing is that those transformations are perfectly linear. So you can use them in perturbation theory. And what you will conclude is that if the, the bare action must be modified, in order to get an invariant counter term, then not only the, the Lagrange density will, uh, will renormalize with an anomalous, an anomalous dimension directly related to the, the beta function, but all the descendant also will. And using this link, you can conclude that there is a problem with uh, any invariant uh, in the carrier potential. Because indeed, if you define a duality symmetry acting on this scalar potential, you know that in general you are going to get an holomorphic function of the scalar field. So it does not affect the invariant because the integral of holomorphic function vanishes, but still gives you something for the Lagrange density. And now, in a full off shell formulation, those things must be total derivative. Divergence, sorry. The thing is that the counting of dimension is such that those dimensions are actually zero. So in order to get a total derivative, you must have something of negative dimension. And the only way you can have this is by having an explicit uh, prepotential appearing in the function. So we don't know what is the structure of this official formulation, ever, if, even if it exists. But wh whatever it is, it must involve a naked prepotential. And naked prepotential will be forbidden in the background field method. So also, the invariant is in fact 
duality invariant, this is not enough. You, you may require more. And in fact, this method is the kind of method you can show, use to show the, the finiteness of n equal 4 super young mills. If you consider n equal 4 super young mills, the classical action, by definition, satisfies all the symmetry of the theory. So you may think that the, the, the one loop on higher order would be, uh, divergence would be uh, allowed. But using this kind of technique, you can show that if there were higher order divergence, this will be associated to one house VPS operator, which you can show also to have zero anomalous dimension. So le let me conclude with, uh, with that. We were asking the, the question, can supersymmetry and duality and invariance explain the absence of logarithm divergence at three loop in n equal four, d equal four supergravity, and respectively two loop in, uh, in five dimension? So, the answer is that if we do the strong assumption that this optional formulation with, with the duality invariant action, which is a strong requirement, is actually possible, then the answer might be yes. We have still some few things to check. So the, the last slide I have been presenting uh, have not been checked completely, and we, uh, we'd like to work out a simple example, at least where we have everything at hand to, uh, to clarify the situation. But in principle, there is no problem with that. So if this is the case, what do we learn about n equal eight supergravity? So th this is in fact a, 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 a tricky question because also those invariants which appear at three loop in n equal four are, are, are very closely related to the invariant which is candidate for seven loop in, uh, in n equal eight supergravity. The structure is still slightly different. So we discussed them in the same paper with uh, Pierre, Paul uh, and Kelly. And we were concluding that the integral of the Berezinian was vanishing also in the case of maximal supergravity. This is actually the computation we started with. But this does not mean necessarily that, that the, the function is, not, is only going to be defined by a, a d28 theta integral, because in principle, the same kind of thing could appear. That is, you, you, you could imagine that you have a specific function of the scalar field which will have the, the same property. This still requires to be worked out because it, it's not completely trivial because you, you'll you are not going necessarily going to get a singlet in the R symmetry once you, uh, you act on such a function because you have much more fermion in this area and many things are possible and maybe there is absolutely no function satisfying those requirements. The theory should be checked, but even if it was true and the same property would appear, it does not change much because if I can argue relying on the 10 dimensional re linear realization that there may be a formalism with full of shell for uh, uh, formulation for n equal four supergravity. This seems to be f a far too uh, to huge uh, requirement for n equal eight. Nobody would believe that there is actually a formulation with 32 supercharged relays on all duality manifest. So this would probably not permit to conclude about seven loop finiteness. And uh, yeah, I conclude with that. <laughs>